Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. I got thinking when the Lord was there praying for His disciples and for people like you and me, can you just with, with me for just a moment in your mind, here he is praying, God the Father, he's talking to him, and who do you think was in front of him? Because he was with them at that time. He'd be looking at Peter over here. And as he saw Peter, he thought, Peter is going to reach so many people for God. So many Jews are going to come to know the Lord as their Savior through Peter. So many churches are going to be started through Peter and the people he's going to disciple. So he's looking at Peter as he begins to pray. And he prays that there'd be unity there. And then he looks over here at John and he realizes that John is going to see so many people in Asia Minor that's going to come to know the Lord as our Savior. So he's praying for John. And then he sees the, the vacancy where Judas Iscariot would have been. But because he was the rummy and left... He's now seeing where that hole is going to be filled by the Apostle Paul and he's thinking about him already ahead of time and praying for him as a future disciple knowing that he'll be starting so many churches in Europe and it's going to spread all over and then we have our church here today. And so I'm looking at all these people that he's praying for and the one thing he's praying for is that they would be unified and how important that really would be to them. Well, if you will, take out your notes, because if you'll notice, the first one is to be rightly unified. I need to park on that just a little bit, because if we're going to be right with the Lord, what does it mean to be rightly unified with Him? That's such a key phrase, to be rightly unified with Him. Now, when we're talking about rightly unified, we're not talking about that we all have to be a part of the same organization. We all have to get all the denominations together that we all have to compromise our theology and the greatest way we have unity is all you have to do is love God, hate Satan, and we're unified. That is not how God operates. That unity is far deeper than all of that. It says a whole lot more about us walking together in love and faith. Let me go back for just a moment. Maybe, and this is Ponza's, I mean, this is my opinion here, it could be that the Lord is now wanting to teach this whole thing of unity and he's doing it because there's an object lesson of what's going on at this very moment. Do you all remember who Matthew was? Matthew represented Rome as a tax collector. A little-known disciple who was there, not much written about him we know, is also a Simon. It wasn't Simon Peter, it was Simon the Zealot. He was one who was a Gentile. He was so zealous because he was against Rome. And so now you have someone who's pro-Rome, someone who's against Rome, and is part of your team right here. And you wonder how that unity must have fit together. So you can see as you look over this group, they were having some challenges. Then you had James and John who were vying to see who's going to be first in the kingdom. And while that was going to happen, you saw the other disciples that were jealous of these guys trying to be the first in the kingdom. So you had disunity going on there. And so the Lord's heart is broken when he sees these kinds of things. And he realizes unless we get on the same page together, quote, the page of biblical accuracy and sound doctrine, what's going to happen then is there's going to be conflict in our life. And may I add one more thing? Knowing sound doctrine only makes you theologically, mentally, intellectually with sound orthodoxy, but that doesn't mean we're living it out. Now we have to live it out, and that's what he's really speaking to here. So it's the right relationship with one another. Oh, how important it is to do that, how that original group and how the future group needed to come together. I did some research to find out how many different denominations there are. Would you like to jot on your piece of paper your guess of how many denominations there are today? At University of California, Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, there's a researcher there by the name of J. Gordon Meltons, and he just put out a new addition to the Encyclopedia of American Religion. I got this out of AP, and so here's what he said. He said that in his list there are 2,633 30 denominations, 2,630 denominations, and two dozen informal families. There's 116 Roman Catholic flocks, hundreds of Pentecostal flocks, and according to a January Associated Press report, among the least mainstream are the following. You have the John F. Kennedy worshipers. It's a church which actually believes, and I'm quoting now, that it can pray to the late president, John F. Kennedy, and can be cured both of congenital defects as well as terminal diseases. Then you have the denomination known as the nudist Christian church of the Blessed Virgin Jesus. I don't have any more information. I didn't want to search any further than that. <laughs> then you have the Church of God Anonymous, the Church of the New Song which once offered porterhouse steaks for communion. 
Then you had 22 other denominations that believe in UFOs, including the clone happy Aurelians. And in addition, it talked about the Church of the Ministry of the Universal Wisdom, which is a church that looks for flying saucers that are going to come. And then there's the church of what's happening now, and it's obviously a more contemporary church. And then we get into the one that's closer to home. Out of the list of 2,630 denominations, he found 30 different denominations calling themselves Baptists alone. Seventh-day Baptist, Two Seed in the Spirit Baptist, Presbyterian Baptist, General Baptist, Regular Baptist, American Baptist, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, Conservative Baptist, and the list goes on. And just uh, last week, I was having breakfast with one of our guys, and he was telling me that he had a relative on the mainland that goes to a church, and the name of that church is called the Scum of the, Scum of the Earth Church. And I haven't Googled that one either. That one must be pretty fantastic as well. I'm not dissing all of them. I'm just going to tell you how that different people want to go through Scripture and to look at all the different things that they have there and how fractured they really are. And so he says that we need to be rightly unified. I want to talk about that. What would be, if we're rightly unified, what would it begin to look like? Hold your place in John 17 and look, if you will, to Philippians. And this will be the only other passage other than John we're going to look at today. But I want you to look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. This is a result of what being unified rightly could look like. I know I'm reducing it to one verse, so it sounds like I'm proof texting this, and I apologize. I don't have enough time to totally unpack it like I'd like to. Why am I giving this to you again? If you want to pray for those that are going through trouble in their life, you want to pray for unity. While you're still finding Philippians chapter 2, let me share this illustration with you. It's an illustration of a true statistic. Um, there are happy things that can bring us together. This afternoon, we're going to be baptizing two people at beautiful Sherwood Forest here, Sherwood Beach, rated number seven in the whole world of best beaches in this year by Dr. Beach. We're going to have a wonderful time eating for those that are able to come, wonderful time baptizing. That's going to bring us together in unity. I will tell you that I do a lot of funerals. I'm called upon to speak. I thank the Lord. Every pastor ought to have some outlet into the community to give the gospel. I thank the Lord that, oddly enough, I can do funerals. I can give the gospel. They're the most tender at that point. And people, even though the family is fractured, they somehow come together in some measure during a funeral. There is tragic times that will still bring... Happy times and sad times can bring people together. But the odd thing about it all is we can go to the picnic this afternoon and have a lot of unity and still go back and begin to cut down and demoralize other people behind their back and fracture the reputations of others. We can go to a funeral and be there with the family and be cordial and be like adults. And then after we have the refreshments and the re whatever you call it, the reception afterwards, we go back to unforgiving the other people and getting on their case and uh, avoiding them and all that kind of stuff. It can happen. I'm grateful that I have pastors who love the Lord, they love you, and they love their families. I've been blessed in all my churches to have all staff that we've been able to get on the same page. Now, that doesn't mean that some like this and other like that. But on the main issues, we had unity. When I pastored in upstate New York, we had beautiful, beautiful parsonages. Ours was a two-story parsonage. We had two-story um, apartment buildings, three, three bedroom, two bedroom, one bedroom for all of our staff. We had four other uh, parsonages. We had beautiful state-of-the-art uh, soccer fields that was so that it would drain when it rains so you could still play soccer on this thing. Beautiful, beautiful gymnasium. We had all of that. The responsibility of the pastors, we would have to take care of literally the acreage that our own parsonage would sit on. It was all connected to this huge campus. And we liked to do that. And one of the little things I enjoyed was getting on that little riding mower, you know. Nobody can call me. I can't get on my emails. Nobody's pestering me. This thing is just rocking. And I'm just, how fast can I get this thing done? Every time I'd mow the yard, I'd try to do it faster than I did the time before. You know, every, everything with my life is trying to beat myself, you know, that kind of thing. I had another pastor, and he'd be out in his yard... And he'd have his, his little three-year-old boy on that little riding mower, and he'd be just chugging along and doing all of that. And I thought, that is so cool. He's out there with his son, and they're doing things, man things together, <laughs> doing all this. And then, a couple weeks later, I read that that's one of the most dangerous things you can do is to take your child and put him up on your lap while you're mowing the yard. And that should a child, and they talked about the people who got killed or maimed because of doing that, the children. And then they did a survey of the families, how that afterwards those families spiked in divorces and animosity and broken homes. And you take that template and you put it against driving recklessly or whatever issues out on the water, whatever it might be. 
that when you go through a crisis, you would think that it would bring the family together, but often, no matter how hard you try, there's not that unity that comes together. And I believe the Lord knows that that's the potential when we go through a crisis of disunity and why He is crying out to God the Father that we would be in unity with one another. We'd be in unity with God the Father and how important that that is. So when you hear of someone going through a crisis like our missionaries, would you pray that they would be in unity when they have to make decisions on what contractor or even to rebuild in the same subdivision or how to spend the money because if they break up that unity over all that good stuff that might come their way, they, like we, could lose our witness just like that. And that's why unity is so important. Well, what would unity might look like? Look over here at Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul, one of those whom the Lord prayed for without mentioning his name in John 17, but generally a future believer, a disciple, says this, Make my joy complete. Let's pause for a moment. I don't think there's anything that makes us happier than when we watch our children getting along with one another. And I think if, you could, if your kids could speak freely they would tell you that nothing brings them greater joy than when mom and dad are laughing and having a good time and are just loving each other genuinely. And so Paul is saying here for the church, which would be, so to speak, his spiritual children, he says, make my joy complete by, and here's the result of unity. He says this, by being of the same mind. Now we're talking about rightly united, so where do we want to have the right mind about? We need to have the right mind about Scripture. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I talked about servanthood there. But it also talked about let the Word of God dwell in you, in your mind richly. Love Him with all your mind richly. So if we're going to be unified in anything, we have to have a common denominator. And the common denominator is not going to be our church heritage, our church traditions. The common denominator we have is a common denominator that will never change over any age, under any situation, and the only common denominator we have, written fashion, is going to be the invariable Word of God right here. Now, yes, it's in Christ and God and the Holy Spirit, but it's all found in the written Word right here. Let the same mind be in you, and if you want to get on the same page, it needs to be the page of Scripture. Now, I know that's another whole message, because people say, well, they use the Bible too, and they don't say the same thing we do. Now you get into hermeneutics. And it all has to be properly interpreted. Number two, go back to the verse again. It says, of the same mind, that brings me great joy. And I like that it started that out first. By being of the same mind, because I think then you have the trickle-down effect. Maintaining the same love. You know, you really can't love someone equally unless you know how to love them properly. And how you love them properly is to get it from God's Word. So if I know how to love a person properly, then I can love them properly equally. Now let me make this clear. It doesn't mean that we're going to have the same emotional connection to everybody. Different personalities will draw. Different common things you have together will draw people together. But the love you're going to show equally to one another. In our church in Southern California, we had a lady who gave birth to triplets. And help me, honey, were they three girls? Twins, okay. I, she's glad I don't want to... Let's bring her back to two instead of three. All right. Boys or girls, honey? First. Two boys and two girls, all right? She gave birth to two girls. Nope. Oh, thank you. I should have get my illustrations right. I, she had two kids first. Can't remember they're boys or girls. And she was so excited, she was pregnant, and then she found out that she was going to have triplets. And so what she told me, she said, you know, when I had the twins, I could go through the mall, and any wife, any mother who had twins seemed to be drawn to her immediately, and they would immediately have something to talk about. She said, when I had the triplets then, all those women who had triplets, wherever I was, they'd see me. We'd all have something in common that brought us together. But she says, I found very few that had twins and triplets in the same family together. What brought them together? A common thing. But love now is going to be no matter if you have kids or no kids. Whether you're single, single again, or been married for 60 years. What brings that together is the same love. Go on, the next part. It says this. United in the same spirit. That means one soul. That means emotionally we're passionate about the same thing. And I believe that would be getting out the gospel intent on one purpose. I believe the one purpose we have is to glorify the Lord. That would be united together in a proper way. Let's look at number two. And these will go more quickly now. What else did he pray for in the unity? It would be reflective of the deity. I think that's important when I talk about the reflection of the deity. Could not you agree with me that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit never had an argument with one another? Could you agree with me with that? Do you think that either any one of them would be at cross purpose of one another? 
No. Do you think anyone loves more than the other one would love? Do you think any one of those that would be there would have a different mind than the other one? They'd all be together. So if we're now going to have the unity what the Lord has here, then that unity that persists, that exists between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit together, now we are partaker of His divine nature. So that unity lives within me because now I have that same unity as it is of the Lord. So now, if I have the Holy Spirit within me and the Son and God in the divine nature, which I do because I've trusted Christ, that's how I get that. All right, that means I have it. That means you have that in you, the divine nature. Then that does mean, based on Scripture, we can get on the same page with one another. So basically I'm saying this, that it reflects his deity, which means that it is accomplishable, that we can't have that fatalistic thing. There's no way we could have unity. Yes, there is. If there can be with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, there can be because he's in me with you. We can be in unity. Now, oh, yeah, that's true. You might like pepperoni on your pizza and I might like cheese and someone else likes anchovies. But one thing we all agree on, we won't eat dirt. We'll eat food. So there's certain things that are going to have that same basis altogether. Number three, we need to be responsive to this truth together. Verses 21 and 23 talk a lot about this. I have, a, um, I have up here in front of me <clears throat> a box of crayons. My wife saw them down here and she said, oh, you left your crayons here. Thank you. I guess you wanted me to draw pictures while you preached. I said, no, no, I'm going to use them up here. Those of you that have, and she was kidding, of course, weren't you? Okay, um, I'm going to spill these crayons out just a little bit out of the box. If you looked at them very carefully, you're going to see some that are used a little bit more, some that are not used as much, some of the papers peel back, some of them are kind of just about a nub left on this. You'll also notice they're different sizes, they're different colors. Some are new, some are older. But one thing I've noticed, that all these are still crayons. None of them become a pencil or a pen. The next thing I notice is they all, all of these, fit into the same box. And so I want you to know that what we're reflecting is the unity that's found in Christ. And while I'm living out my life, no matter what different personality style you have, whatever gifting you have, whatever ethnic background you have, no matter your age, whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter if you're a new believer, a middle believer, an older believer. In other words, you've been walking with the Lord a long time. We all can fit in here as long as we're all crayons. And for us, we'll all fit together as long as we are blood-bought, born-again believers in Christ. I talked to a, a gal, Carol and I were on the phone together with her recently, a sweet gal, and basically she says she's all alone. She's trying to take care of her mother as a caregiver. Her mother is a, a recovering alcoholic but has got bipolar. She doesn't have anybody to help her. And so Carol and I said, is there anybody in your life for support where you live? They, she lives 4,000 miles away. And she says, yes, I've got some people in my life that I think can help me. She described one as a Mormon. She described another as just a good person. And the third one, she says, is a Christian that backslides a lot, that just doesn't always walk with God. And I said, you know, you have a lot of good people in your life, but what you're missing is someone who is a spiritually mature person who is vitally connected to the Lord in an intimate way to come alongside you to give you the coaching, the modeling, the mentoring that you need. And here's what her response was. Would you pray for me that I could have someone like that? And I said, I will. And then Carol volunteered herself to be available. And here's what her response was. Her response was this. I have a terrible relationship with my mother. I fear mothers. And I said, you know what? Nobody fears Carol but me. So I want you to know that Carol will be your mother to help you through this time of feeling like you're alone. Now, as good as that is, and the connection Carol has with the Lord and with her and all that, she cannot model it. This gal can only hear Carol's voice. Experience Carol's prayers. But it's responsive when they're able to see that. And I want to end with the last one because we're running out of time and this is probably the most important. And that is that it becomes really reflective as we look to the future of the glory of the Lord together. While we're going to use God's word, starting with salvation by faith alone. Secondly, understanding God's word as our rule and practice and that it is sufficient. We need no other book for our sufficiency. Our decisions based on what we're going to do, will be found on God's Word, all right? But at the same time, we know that we will only be totally, fully unified together in the future that God has for all of us. And so I pray that even now, that some of you that may not be totally on the same page with one another yet, 
that you will just for a moment lay down some of those differences that you have and celebrate what you can agree on. God is God, Jesus is God, the Holy Spirit is God, salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone, the Word of God is sufficient for us. And using those as your unifying factors, watch this now, that we now, knowing we have the Holy Spirit and the Trinity within us now, that we can now love each other and look to the future, knowing that we're all going to be together. So my encouragement is, look at those people that are struggling right now in your life, and what you want to pray for them now is that they would experience unity but the real unity that they would have with one another would be born on a unity that Christ has with God the Father. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed, some of you are really hearing this and you're thinking, I, I feel like I'm kind of outside looking in. I'm not part of God's forever family. And I want to be a part of that. Well, it's so easy for you to do that because you're really not in unity with God's family. Saying you're a Christian does not make you a Christian. Like one person said, being Born in a car, being born in a garage doesn't make you a car. Being born in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. But being born again by faith alone really will. So I pray for you right now that maybe right now in your own mind you'd see that you are lost. You're separated from Him. You tried to do good deeds, but good deeds doesn't get you to heaven. That's why grace had to step in. And God then went to the cross in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And He rose again from the dead. And I pray that perhaps today would be the day that you would come to him by faith alone and not by your works. And that you realize that Jesus says, he that believes on me has everlasting life. And having eternal life is more than just fire insurance. John 17 says it's also to know him personally, intimately, experientially, to know him, to know life eternal in Christ. And I pray that now you're trusting Christ as your Savior. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'd like to pray for you. So... I'm going to ask you in a moment to slip up your hand and let me assure you, raising your hand won't get you in, into heaven or God's family. Me praying for you won't. Any more than walking an aisle or even getting baptized. None of those things will get you to be a part of God's forever family. You become unified with the Lord when you realize Jesus paid for your sins when he died 2,000 years ago. And by placing your faith alone in him, you can have everlasting life. So now, if you're saying something like this to the Lord, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. Can you say to the Lord, Lord, I know I've done things wrong. I know I'm not perfect. I do believe that Jesus died and rose again. And the best I know how, I'm trusting Jesus Christ as the one who will forgive me of all my sin. Now that will put you into his forever family. That will make you to be one of those that he prayed for in John 17. That you would know him and be unified in him as he is in his Father. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, is there anyone here today by an uplifted hand that would indicate that they're trusting Christ as their personal Savior? Never done it before, but they're calling upon the Lord as their personal Savior today by faith and faith alone. Would you slip up your hand? Is there anyone at all? Christians, take a moment now as I pray, and would you pray for that person that's going through some real deep time in their life? And maybe just as we begin on the prayer of the, Father, or the, prayer of the Son to the Father, that we'll pray for them to experience that unity. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be in your forever family and we thank you that you've made us obviously different and that different ones are taller and shorter, man and woman. We know that some have different ethnic backgrounds. But Father, we've all been made different. But Father, how much we need to be in unity because that's what people are going to look at to see genuine, authentic Christianity. Now Father, I pray for those that are going through some deep times like my friend Randy, and Jasmine, that gentleman who is at a challenge in his life right now. For that gal who doesn't have anyone who feels sometimes that she's all alone. For the one who is now at the last winter of her life without a life partner, a mate. And the feeling of rejection. Now, Father, I pray that through all of them that they would experience the unity that can be found in Christ. Even when perhaps the world around them is not so unified to them. Now, Father, help us as a church to be strong in unity. I'm grateful for the fact that this church has no drama in here, that we are working on this, and when we bump into one another, we ask forgiveness and we try to make things right, and that we love each other. We let, allow the other person to grow in grace at their own speed and appreciate the strengths and the things that you built into their lives, and we see value in them, and that together we grow. And so, Lord, thank you for that. But 
Lord, we do ask that you would deliver us from the evil one who would want to be a divider and not a uniter. And so, Father, we do love you now. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.